President Lee, please come on stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Actually, it's a very boring title. Um, I regretted it as soon as I sent it in. Can we bring up the slides, please? Thank you. Uh, this is my second talk on this stage in the last four or five days. The European Commission had a big ICT conference here earlier this week where I was also a keynote speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here in Vilnius uh, one year later after my first visit in November. Um, can we get a show of hands? How many are from Lithuania? Ooh, I like those numbers. Okay. Um, so we're going to focus on um, four topics. Uh, you've had a lot of great talks today. I don't want to repeat some of the earlier points which you've heard. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about great product design, and I want to start with talking about some really great products out of Lithuania. So again, could all the Lithuanians please raise their hands? Okay, could you stand up please? All the Lithuanians stand up. Okay, um, wow, these are great numbers. Um, so. In the United States, there's a very famous ad campaign called Got Milk, which has featured many famous stars uh, from famous movies, real people, basically promoting milk and other American dairy products. Now, I know that dairy products are a certain uh, area of interest for Lithuania today, given uh, international relations in this area. And so I'd like everyone else to please stand up. And I'd like to please all the non-Lithuanians, especially Silicon Valley and New Yorkers. Uh, I'd like to pay tribute to great Lithuanian dairy products. As an example of Lithuanian technology and produce. And I hope all the non-Lithuanians will purchase and promote the Lithuanian dairy products industry while they're here this week. Okay, so. And for the non-Lithuanians, there is a deeper meaning behind my comments. I would invite you to ask your local Lithuanian friends here who you're, who you're sitting next to exactly what is Burton Lee talking about and why is he talking about dairy products, just to explain a little bit of the, the current context that's going on here locally. Um, but products, product, great products are the heart of a great startup company. Uh, in my work across Europe, I lecture at Stanford on European entrepreneurship and innovation. I'll say a bit more about that at the end. Um, the history of entrepreneurship training and education historically is really focused on the business model developments, on developing the slide deck. And what we've been doing at Stanford for the last 10 years is really focusing and beyond, uh, I come out of mechanical engineering, is focusing on product design as the basis for a great startup, and specifically the product market business model fit. Those of you who follow Alex Ostervalda's work, Steve, Blank work, Steve Blank's work, and the area of design thinking understand that at the heart of a great startup, you have to have a great product, a great product concept. You have to take it into the marketplace to allow users to play with prototypes. You have to understand whether you're getting traction with that product concept through multiple prototypes, some of which you throw out, before you really know, before you know whether you really have a great product or company that you can build around that product. So start with a product and great product design. Uh, design thinking has uh, a practice called need finding uh, where you essentially take prototypes and product concepts, get users to give you early feedback on whether they could see themselves using this. There's a whole process around soliciting feedback from users. It's a way of reducing risk. You want to delay building engineering prototypes as long as possible because that entails additional cost but it also tends to freeze your thinking when you start engineering real products. So at Stanford and at IDEO and in the Valley and some of the best companies, we try and delay actual engineering as long as possible and prototype things with simple drawings, cardboard, paper, plastic to allow users to play with them, 
get feedback, try lots of different variants before you actually start building engineering prototypes. It allows your team, your thinking to be much more flexible. It's easier to pivot if you haven't spent a lot of time, capital investing in uh, real engineering uh, prototypes and models. And so great product design, you have to start with a great product before you can build a great company. Uh, this is an issue in Europe also because traditionally engineering design in Europe uh, which is taught in many technical schools, in all technical schools, tends to favor more of an incremental approach to design. It's really design optimization. It's about engineering optimization, simulation, very technical, uh, a lot of modeling, very incremental. And what we pioneered at Stanford in the mechanical engineering department, in the design school, is what we call disruptive product design based on design thinking methods. If you really want to come up with entire new product concepts or product categories, sometimes you have to question very fundamental assumptions about how people use things, about what their real needs are. You have to go into uh, marketplaces, you have to go into hospitals looking at how people actually behave, how they work with things, how they talk and interact with each other with equipment. That's where some of the very fundamental new disruptive product concepts are coming from today. Europe traditionally has, has developed a very strong infrastructure and ecosystem around incremental product development and design and manufacturing. What is largely missing in Europe today is a sustainable ecosystem around disruptive product design uh, and development. And this is where the great companies are built around disruptive products. Look at the tablet, for example, Skype, for example. So uh, again, starting with Lithuanian dairy products to mobile apps, it all starts with great products. Um, those of you who've been following the IPO scene in the US lately, are very aware of the Twitter IPO. Um, and most of the media discussion you'll hear is about all the money that's being made by the initial investors, the founders. What's not discussed so much is how much money is being made by the other early employees. And so here's some hard numbers that have been developed by an economic analyst firm that's estimated that the Twitter IPO means in excess of 1,600 new millionaires are being created, most of them in Silicon Valley, but in a few other locations around the world. Now, part of the issue in Europe around the difficulty of building companies is the lack of angel investors who have strong tech experience. And when you have an IPO like this, you're building the ecosystem in Silicon Valley with a couple of thousand new millionaires who have tech experience. In the case of Microsoft, Google, Hewlett Packard, the numbers are even bigger. Thousands of thousands of new mi millionaires are, are being created, many of whom go on to invest in a new generation of startups or build new companies. So, when you're a founder, a co-founder, CEO, you have to also think about the ecosystem. You have to t take some small responsibility also for developing your local ecosystem here in Lithuania and in the Baltics. And one of the reasons you want to think seriously about offering stock options and encouraging employees to take these and explaining what they are and how they benefit, uh, other than attracting great employees, but one of the reasons you want to offer stock options and spread the wealth, as Gigi said, as broadly as possible is because it's very important for building the ecosystem, the entrepreneurship startup ecosystem here in Lithuania, in the Baltics, and in Europe. This has been a persistent challenge in Finland, Sweden, um, Estonia. We have small numbers of new, new wealthy individuals being created. We have to increase those numbers to be in the hundreds and thousands, the way you do it in terms of scaling up the ecosystem by impacting not just the entrepreneurship side but the investor side is through stock options and successful companies that you can grow to this level. This is why stock options are important. It's, a, it's also about building the local ecosystem. So here are some very concrete numbers. Uh, this rarely happens in Europe. The public policy in Europe is typically aimed at 
creating as few millionaires as possible. That's, that's official unstated goals, but that's effectively what tax policy in many European countries is aimed at. Uh, in Silicon Valley, we, we believe it's important to create new millionaires, but not just any kind of millionaire who goes off and invests in a house or buys a yacht. The millionaires we create, the best ones, the majority of them, go and invest in a new generation of companies. They start social ventures, foundations. So this creation of new wealth and distribution of new wealth beyond the initial founders of three, four, five people to hundreds of other people is very important for democratizing entrepreneurship, for broadening its benefits to the rest of the population, but also to allow the broader ecosystem, economy, communities to form many, many more companies. And this will benefit you directly when each of you goes on to form your second and third company, because then you will have a stronger ecosystem of established angel investors around you who understand tech, who've actually done tech. So that's stock options. Now, this is uh, a third topic which I've spoken about recently at policy conferences at the European Parliament, and again uh, here on Wednesday in Vilnius, and that is that Europe has a demand problem. And I'm talking about demand for innovation. And I don't think a lot of people in Europe really understand this because you've grown up here, you haven't seen what demand, strong demand for innovation looks like uh, a la Silicon Valley. But the, one of the problems in growing companies in Europe and in emerging economies around the world, I also work in Latin America, is it can be very difficult to find early adopters locally, early adopting consumers and early adopting enterprises. The basic approach of governments today around the world is what I call supply of innovation. It's innovation push. It's building more companies. It's funding more companies. It's getting technology out of the door of universities and research institutes into the marketplace. That's supply of technology. Why do many, many startups fail here in Europe? It's because of lack of local demand, or it's because demand is delayed, or because demand is small. Um, this is a very big problem. It forces many European startups to essentially look for early adopters, primarily in the United States, both among consumers and enterprises. Not all of them, and we'll talk about this in a minute, uh, there are some European startups who do succeed in getting early traction here in Europe. And one of my points is that we're not doing enough uh, here in Europe to really understand what is it that great European startups are doing, the ones that really build themselves around local markets, and I don't mean just national markets, but around local early adopters, early adopting consumers, early adopting enterprises. We need to do a better job of understanding how they're doing that so that more of you can have greater successes in building your companies initially or in part around local early adopters so you don't depend entirely on American Silicon Valley early adopters. The early adopter phenomenon is extremely important. I think European startups need to be sharing and investors need to be sharing more information about where their early customers are coming from so that other entrepreneurs can understand how they're actually recruiting those early adopting consumers and enterprises from around Europe. And we need to get better about sharing tips on how to get early traction here in the European marketplace because every time you have, whenever you have local companies being formed, but the early adopting customers are elsewhere, primarily in the US, guess what? They're going to have to move closer to their early adopting customers. This is one of the important reasons why European startups, many of them even today, continue to go to the US and Latin American startups and other startups. It's, it's not just because of the venture capital, it's because the early adopting customers are found in much greater, greater numbers in the US. If you have more early adopters here, you will be better able to build your companies here initially. So th this is a difficult issue to adopt. Why, do, why don't we see more viral growth among consumers here in Europe, for example? There are some examples. So Raspberry Pi, Eben Upton, the founder of Raspberry Pi, was here on the stage on Wednesday. 
And he said that most of the initial growth for Raspberry Pi, they're up to two million boards now, came from the UK marketplace. Well, that's very interesting. How do other UK firms, European firms, uh, basically sell early hardware devices to local markets as well and then scale up beyond their local market? So this is something that each of you needs to think about. This impacts very much how you approach the sales and marketing function, where you focus your efforts. This is where the analytics becomes very important to understand exactly where those early adopters are geographically, figuring out where you need to be with your sales and marketing teams, but also where you need to focus your social media efforts and other marketing efforts. Geography matters a great deal. Finally, I'm going to just say a couple of remarks about building an innovation culture. There have been uh, many other speakers who've addressed this. Um, this is a very important topic which is continually discussed in Silicon Valley going back decades, initially around Hewlett Packard. It's one of the secrets to success of Google. It's the ch main challenge that Marissa Meyer is facing at Yahoo today is pivoting culture, reshaping company culture into an innovation culture. This is not well understood in Europe because European business schools, and not just European business schools, but most American business schools are not doing a good job of talking about what it means to create an innovation culture in companies. Yesterday I gave a talk at ISM School of Management and Economics. It's a private business school here in Lithuania. Uh, we had a very good discussion with the students and faculty over there. This issue of innovation culture, it's very confusing. Typically in Europe, when, when people use the word culture, the assumption is, well, we're talking about national cultures. It's Lithuanian culture, Russian culture, German, and our company will be German or it will be a French company. Well, in the Valley, when we talk about innovation culture, we're talking about company identity, mission, values. What are the behaviors we want to promote? What are the behaviors uh, attitudes we want to discourage. The formation of a strong innovation culture specific to your company, specific to your company's circumstances and missions and goals is very important in the early phases as well as later phases, particularly if, if there's a chance you may need to pivot. If you have to pivot your company around a new product concept, if you have a weak, weak company culture around innovation, it's going to be much more difficult to hold that team together. And so this is something that you need to think about from day one because the second and third people you hire, are, you're already establishing what the culture of that company is going to be. So you can't wait until you're successful. You can't wait until you're revenue positive to, to begin thinking about the company culture, the company innovation culture you want to establish. You have to begin thinking about that from day one as a competitive advantage to attract talent, but also for sustained competitive advantage in a very quickly moving marketplace. So just a few words about myself. I lecture at Stanford, uh, now going on five years on European entrepreneurship and, and innovation. Uh, I invite you to visit our website. Uh, our lectures going back five years are all available. We've also recently, sorry, uh, opened up a YouTube channel, which is free content. This year we had Peter Halachi and Peter Arvai from Prezi come and speak as our first Hungarian startup. Uh, Peter Vesterbaka from Angry Birds, Alexander Jung from SoundCloud. We have a lot of great speakers, both startups and investors. Uh, we're ramping up for year six, starting in January. Our first speakers will be uh, Sasha Galiski, one of Russia's top venture capitalists. Um, and Alice Zagari, who's CEO of The Family in Paris. Very interesting new, new accelerator and co-working space. So this is free content, which we're putting online from Stanford University as part of our uh, broad in, broader initiative in online education. Um, over the past five years, we've had numerous partnerships, including Innovation Center Denmark, uh, various other European governments. We hope to bring on Enterprise Lithuania at some point as a partner as well. This year we've had Venova, uh, Invest Northern Ireland, and also Enterprise Estonia as partners. So very strong connections into the entire Baltic region. 
So uh, thank you very much. Do we have time for any questions? Sure. What was that? Anyone who would like to ask something or do you prefer one-on-one -on -one meetings afterwards? I'll take it as a yes. So here comes the Frisbee. And then since we're going to start the break, you can catch Burton somewhere next to coffee probably. Catch it. Here we go. Oh my god, they're going to fight. So thank you very much. Well, thank uh, you. This is for you. Thanks for making it. Thank you. And um, Lithuanian Dairy Products. Yay! Yay. Go Lithuania!